God. Guys, I absolutely love this place. The trees, just the right height, to be fair. <laughs> Plus, it's wonderful that we have a great opposition team that finally has recognized the fact that corporations, <coughs> in fact, Lucas, are people. <laughs> Lucas, we both know that you have not, like, no money at all to afford a brilliant Mitt Romney hair song. We also know that you're just not as good looking at Mitt Romney. And finally, <laughs> we, we, finally <laughs> we know that you would never have a binder with a bunch of women's names in it. <laughs> so, uh, for these three points, I move that we take the minutes of bread. Parker, Parker, I've heard all of this before, and quite frankly, you're wrong. This chamber wants to hear the minute. I'll bet you $10,000 for it. <laughs> <laughs> I trained as a historian, and I find it useful at times simply to step back and try to put current events into some kind of larger perspective, at least a bit larger than the hurly-burly of the campaign on a given day. And that's what I want to do this evening. I want very briefly to sketch out the kind of legacy that the previous president, George Bush, received when he became president, and briefly mention that which was bequeathed to Obama, and then talk about very briefly again what Obama has done in the last four years. <coughs> if you remember, George Bush inherited a budget that was in balance, and it had been in balance for three years. Indeed, for the first time in six decades, we began to pay down, although only modestly, the national debt. He, he inherited a booming economy, an economy that in the previous eight years had created 23 million jobs. He, he followed an administration that briefly and modestly was able to reverse or at least halt for a time the growing income, in, income inequality afflicting the U.S. for the past four decades and in fact afflicting most modern industrial democracies around the globe. And he, inherited, he, he followed an administration that with the Republican help had reformed welfare and had enacted a number of free trade measures, including NAFTA. Contrast that with this shambles that George Bush bequeathed President Obama. An economy in crisis, the worst since the Great Depression, we were suffering both from a recession and a financial crisis. We've suffered recessions before, and we know what they look like. We know how quickly we can recover from them. We've suffered financial crises before, and we know that sometimes they have very little effect upon the overall economy, and indeed that they too can be got through fairly equally. But when they both occur at the same time, it means that you're in for a long, hard struggle. <coughs> a stagnant economy, he, he bequeathed to Obama, an economy that had created basically no net jobs in the previous eight years, and in fact for the last few months of the uh, Bush administration and the first three months of the Obama administration was losing, losing 750 to 800,000 jobs a month. 
an economy that was shrinking not by the 4% that economists thought of at the moment in January of 2009, but that in fact turned out to be 8%. And it was a crisis that would be all the more difficult to deal with because the usual economic remedies were not available, precisely because of the, de of the debt that Bush had run up during his eight years, doubling the American debt, <coughs> two wars totally unpaid for, unique in American history, added benefits in Medicare, drug benefits that were totally unpaid for, two tax cuts largely benefiting disproportionately those at the top of the income ladder, and thus accounting, rather, uh, accentuating rather, rather than remunerating the underlying problem of growing inequality in American society, worse since the 1890s and the 1920s. And what has Obama done? With the incredibly effective actions of the Federal Reserve and building on the proposals of Bush's Secretary of the Treasury, I think you can say in all fairness it was little short of saving the economic system of the developed West. How many of us remember, some of you are perhaps too young to remember, but in those, those last days of 2008 and the first two months or three months of 2009, that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach because the whole world economic system seemed to be teetering on collapse. And what followed? A stimulus with a middle class tax cuts. One third of the stimulus plans, uh, in fact, were middle class tax cuts, later reinforced by payroll tax cuts, which also benefited primarily the middle class. State and local gov government aid and infrastructure construction. One can argue that it was not enough. <coughs> But nonetheless, it at least staunched the, ble the bleeding and forestalled the complete collapse of the American and the world economy. And what followed were a series of reforms, Dodd-Frank, uh, to the financial system to try to ensure as much as one can that we do not experience the same thing again. What followed as well was a health care reform. The United States spills, spends one-sixth of its GDP on health care, and yet its outcomes uh, are no better than many other industrial countries, including this one, which spend a little more than half that. Progress in social welfare, uh, social issues, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, don't tell the Lilly Ledbetter Act, the first act that the President signed, uh, which ensured the right of, of women to go to the courts and, and ensure that they could receive equal pay for equal work. And much more could have been done had the Republicans not obstructed from day one. On the evening of Obama's inauguration, 12 Republicans, including Ryan, met at a steakhouse in Washington, D.C. to talk not about what they could do for the country to help uh, solve the problems and the crisis that we face, but rather how they could forestall any progress under Obama in order to avoid him getting any kind of political credit. It was a position that was later taken by Mitch McConnell, the Republican, uh, senator, uh, Republican leader in the Senate, and it was one that meant that no jobs bill passed, no subsequent stimulus was enacted, and that even bills that had previously been supported by the Republican Party were voted against simply because they did not want to give President Obama <coughs> a victory. An auto industry that was rescued, unemployment still at 8% or a little bit below that, though uh, for 36 months, uh, positive job growth uh, in the economy uh, every month and now a little bit below 8%, uh, but not much. There's still much to do. An 8% decline in GDP, which we've recovered entirely from since the crisis, but unemployment still lags behind. There's still much to do, as I say, but nonetheless, as the IMF report last Thursday indicated, the U.S. is in far better position than any other major financial nation. I won't touch upon the foreign policy arena. My colleague will do that a, a bit later. So what do we make of the question before us, the motion before this House? If you believe that the U.S. should be led by a man whose views are fundamentally on fundamental issues seem to shift depending upon which office he is running for or which audience he is addressing on a given day, then vote no on this motion. Mitt Romney is your man. If you believe that the U.S. should be led by a man who during the primary season never showed that he had the moral fiber to stand up against the more extreme or kooky elements in his party, Unlike John McCain in 2008, who reprimanded the woman in a town hall debate <coughs> when she alleged that the president was uh, a, a Muslim, and unlike Bill Clinton in 1992, 
when he stood up against Sister Soldier. If that is your belief, if that's the kind of person you want as President of the United States, then vote no on this motion, Mitt Romney is your man. Look at the advisors and policies proposed by the Romney campaign. They're basically the same advisors and the same policies that got us into the trouble, in trouble under the Bush administration. If you believe that the next administration should be staffed by the same personnel or policies that were in place under Bush, policies that brought us to the economic crisis, then vote no on this motion, Mitt Romney is your man. But if, like me, you believe that the slow but steady progress we've made in pulling out of the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, then vote yes, support Obama. If, like me, you believe that Barack Obama's likely appointees to the Supreme Court would be far preferable to those likely to be made by his opponent, especially given the kind of obeisance that Romney showed during the primary campaign to the far right, and, and, and the fact that he's advised by Robert Bork, which, which some of you who study American constitutional history may know, then vote yes on this resolution, support President Obama. If you believe that a return to the personnel and policies of the Bush administration, the very people and policies, as I say, that created the economic crisis should be avoided, and rather that we should pr persevere and pursue the slow and difficult but sure path that, pr that President Obama has charted, then vote yes on this motion, support President Obama. For all these reasons, I urge you to support this motion and vote yes. sound pretty awesome, I would say. Uh, we're out of crisis, apparently, and everything is going to go back to the way it was. Uh, and everything was actually apparently Bush's fault. Uh, no, dot-com bubble didn't happen. That didn't have an effect on tax revenue. And apparently the financial crisis was Bush's fault because of the deficit, which makes a lot of sense. Nothing to do with government housing policy for the last 30 years or monetary policy for the last 30 years. This is casual, normal, democratic lack of understanding of basic economic learning. Okay, there you go. Um, why have the Republicans, uh, they've apparently been stalling the president? Well, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because we have $16 trillion. $16 trillion, enough to, if you stack $1 bills up on top of itself, go above the moon and back down twice. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. $16 trillion. I'd like $16 <laughs> trillion. Yeah. It's pretty cheap, right? <laughs> By the end, <laughs> for Mitt Romney, yeah. True. Fair point. <laughs> by the time I finish this speech, the United States federal debt will have increased by $14 million. By the end of today, it will have increased by $3.5 billion. And that is why we currently have a debt of $16 trillion. Of course, it was all Bush's fault. We had no debt problems before or during or after Bush's presidency whatsoever. Obama, however, has contributed a lot to lowering the deficit. Of course, um, I'd like to take you all back to August 2011. Uh, a time when a lot in both political parties were pretty pissed off when uh, Moody's uh, threatened to downgrade the U.S.'s credit rating and when S&P actually did downgrade the U.S.'s credit rating. What happens when credit rating is downgraded?